This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. We've got a, a panel that's um, got fabulous information for us, and I'm going to turn to them right now and ask Louise Kellogg to join up here as the moderator. Oh, she's, no, she's right here, um, who's here at UC Davis, a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences and the director of the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics. Thank you very much. I, I want a musical about geology now. <laughs> I think you may have had to leave to catch a plane, so uh, we used to be geology. So uh, thank you uh, very much for sticking around for the next panel. I'm really excited about this panel, which I think will be um, lovely. I'm going to, uh, just in the interest of time, kind of minimize the amount of um, time I spent on the introductions. There are biographies of our panelists in the brochure that you have, but let me just briefly say what we're going to do, and thank you. And um, and who we have. So on the panel, we have uh, Meg Urey, who you've met this morning. Uh, and uh, she is the uh, Munson Professor of Physics and Astronomy and the director of the Yale Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics at uh, Yale University. And her research area is in black holes. And uh, she, uh, as a result of her efforts to increase the um, participation of women in astrophysics, she won the 2010 Women in Space Science Award from the Adler Planetarium. Uh, and uh, Meg is going to provide, uh, we're going to talk, this panel is about, um, about uh, site visits, using site visits to improve the climate. And so Meg is going to, we, all of the panelists have a, um, a different, different perspectives on that from their own uh, experience. So Meg is going to provide a summary of the site visit process. She's been on many site visits, including how that work is initiated. Okay, uh, how a visit is initiated, how the presentations are made, what, the, what work a department needs to do uh, in preparation, uh, what kind of feedback to expect, and then um, how to respond and what kind of follow-up there will be. Uh, and then we're going to hear also from Omar, Omar uh, Blaise, Blaise, thank you, uh, who is a professor and past chair at, of the Department of Physics uh, at UC Santa Barbara. His work is in theoretical astrophysics, so, so you see a trend here. And in the panel, I think the <laughs> physics uh, field has, has, takes advantage of these um, uh, site visits a lot. Uh, so he initiated uh, a site visit uh, in, out of concern for uh, the climate in his department and hosted it while he was chair. And so he's going to talk about his experience with that. And then we will also hear from Angelica Stacy. Angelica is the um, is the Vice Provost for Faculty Equity and Welfare and Professor of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. Uh, her research is on materials in, uh, in energy with energy applications. And she's going to describe the advisory work done by the Committee on the Advancement of Women Chemists, COACH. So that's a different COACH than we heard them from this morning. Uh, and this, the work that the COACH Committee does with leaders of universities and research institutions and government organizations and departments in, in order to create uh, professional workplaces for that provide equal opportunity uh, for careers for underrepresented groups from STEM fields in chemistry, with a focus on chemistry. So our panel basically is going to look at site visits. Site visits are often sponsored by professional uh, associations. They are a powerful tool for departments um, that are looking at investigating their work climate, and so that's uh, that's what we're going to investigate today. Uh, they identify uh, the climate issues that may not be apparent to people within the department or uh, help clarify those, and they can help uh, a department or an institution institutionalize uh, practical approaches that improve the climate. Um, so we're gonna hear from each of you to review the um, 
uh, the process, you each have 10 minutes <laughs> to talk, and then we'll have lots of time for uh, another half an hour for questions and answers at the end of that. Uh, so I'm going to go in, the, in that order that I just introduced. So Meg, would you like to start? Okay, sure, yeah. So let me just quickly give you a sense of what uh, a, a site visit, at least from the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, uh, looks like. Uh, these started 25 years ago. Um, and I counted up how many institutions have been visited. It's about 45 physics departments and 14 national laboratories have been visited by this kind of committee from the APS, American Physical Society. Um, uh, we, the committee, sorry, the visiting committees respond to invitations from chairs. So if the chair of a department or a lab leader asks for a visit, that, that request goes to the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics and then they put together a committee. The idea is that the department or lab should be um, should be eager to have such a visit, not have it imposed on them. So only in response. So you can sort of think of these departments as being uh, uh, open to change. Um, typically, the chair is, is selected by the CSWP, and then the chair, together with the APS, puts together a committee with expertise to reflect the expert the you know experts in the department so that there's a mutual recognition and respect it used to be only senior women and more recently has included senior men um, the thinking there opposite arguments uh, for a long time the CSWP felt that only if if the committee were all women would the women students open up uh, some of us argued that only if you had men on the committee would the senior faculty listen. So <laughs> opposite concerns. Um, the, it, in advance of the visit, there's a confidential survey administered to the department, and that is analyzed by the American Institute of Physics, the statisticians there who are very good. So that it reports attitudes and, and sort of a climate survey, if you like, of the department. And, and the committee has that in advance before they meet uh, at the department. Typically, it's a one-day visit. For the very large organizations, it can be more than one day. And you basically have a, a schedule from dawn to dusk of nonstop meetings with various groups that are segregated. So undergraduates only, uh, men only, and then women only. Uh, graduate students, men only, women only, et cetera, through the day. Um, I talked this morning briefly about what we find, so I won't repeat that. Uh, and then following the visit, the uh, committee prepares a report which talks about what we found and makes recommendations for how the department could improve its climate for women in physics. So I'll just cite some common recommendations. Some of these are from best practices, and there was a very nice study done by Barbara Witten who went to departments that produced unusually high numbers of women or minority physicists and tried to figure out what they did and wrote a, wrote a nice piece about it. So. Um, the general finding is that women are the canaries in the coal mine. So any, any environmental um, toxicity, if you like, that really is affecting everyone seems to affect the women more. So if you, as someone said this morning, uh, if you fix those problems for the women, you fix them for everyone. So um, <clears throat> let's see, community social events to make the department more welcoming, that's a common um, recommendation, uh, there are studies, including a famous study at Carnegie Mellon that showed this had a big impact on the participation of women in computer science in that case. Um, advice about uneven evaluation, I think we all know, people in this room know that's a big topic. Uh, many of our scientific colleagues don't believe it exists. Um, promoting networking among women and minorities is really an interesting um, point because women, um, talking to other women has been one of the most powerful ways of starting to climb out of a hole. And where there are few women, we suggest ways of bringing in senior women, either from other departments or other laboratories, et cetera, et cetera. And addressing family issues is always a priority. So those are sort of generic recommendations that are, of course, tailored in response to the specific situations in departments. But there's kind of a commonality to, to the reports that, um, I, in other words, what I'm trying to say is it's not that the report itself is so very special but that the occasion for having the dialogue, having the report, and sending it to the chair is an occasion, is a listening moment or a teaching moment. Um, so the report goes, uh, we write a report, it goes to the chair. It is the chair's report to do with what he or she will. So if they want to talk about it with the faculty or present it to their provost or whatever, that's up to them. Um, 
sometime after that, usually about a year, year and a half after the visit, uh, the, the chair is asked to respond in writing to uh, document what has changed or what, um, uh, what, uh, what steps he or she took in response to the report. And that is the only evaluation that is done. So um, this is one of the, I would say, under-evaluated programs in a way, but it's running on the very, uh, it's running on the very thin fuel of the way too busy bunches of women and way too busy faculty at the visited departments. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, do what you can. Uh, and it's lasting 25 years and, and people asking in a few cases for repeat visits, I think means it hasn't been totally ineffective. So I'm finishing early, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> As Meg said, um, uh, the, these site visit reports are, are, can be made as private as you like. It's a, it's a report that's given to the chair. And uh, uh, so uh, when I was invited here, uh, <laughs> uh, do I really want to air the UCSB physics department's dirty laundry in front of the uh, high level administration of the entire system uh, and, and, and actually be filmed doing it as well? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then I, and, and watching, listening to the presentations this morning, I decided, yes, I do want to do that. And so I am going to show you the, the, the our dirty laundry um, at, at the risk of, I don't know what risk. Um, uh, so the, these slides aren't really, uh, you know, well prepared because I just cobbled them together, but uh, I hope you, you find them illuminating. So let me, I, I became chair in, uh, in uh, uh, July 2010. and. Really, within days of becoming chair, I was made aware of the, some of these issues. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, some students approached me uh, complaining about some really outrageous comments that were made by graduate student teaching assistants in our undergraduate study room. And, and, and they're comments that I simply can't repeat publicly. They, they were truly, truly outrageous and, and offensive uh, to women. Uh, students and really created a, uh, obviously are, were creating a, neg a very negative climate. I also was made aware that there were in classes, not my classes that I was aware of, but maybe they were happening in my classes too, that male students would bully women students when they tried to ask questions or would belittle them when they were asking questions of the faculty member. And the faculty member was not challenging those students uh, for, for doing that. Uh, so there was this, okay, so there were some issues like that. And then uh, I got, I started looking into, or we, I was told of some statistics regarding our students. Uh, we had declining percentages of UCSB physics bachelor degrees awarded to women. 10% uh, of our degrees were going to women, and yet it was 20% nationally. I'll show you that uh, data later. Uh, also, the percentages of UCSB PhD phys uh, physics degrees that were being awarded to women were um, about at the national average, but they were declining in recent years, uh, just as I became chair. And, uh, and also, the year just be prior to me becoming chair, normally we admitted about 20% of, uh, of students who were women into our PhD program. One out of 25 uh, students turned out to be a woman in that particular year. So just the year that I uh, came being chair, we had a, a sharp decline. That was a fluctuation, but still it was worrying. And then finally in 2010, as you all know, the National Research Council rankings came out. And UCSB physics, to our great pride, uh, landed in the top five or six, depending on whether you looked at the RRS rankings. And so we, you know, we had really made it into one of the top ranked physics departments in the nation. And so we were incredibly proud of that achievement. But you may also know that there were, there were subcategories of rankings. In particular, there was a diversity variable that also had its own rankings. And so we were five or six from the top out of 161 programs in the nation. And we were fifth from the bottom in the diversity variable. By the way, UCLA was even below us. <laughs> and, uh, and other UC physics departments were also quite low. So I, as chair, analyzed this data in detail because that you could look at the entire NRC data. And I found out that it actually about half the, I have another message here that goes beyond the advanced program. Half the, the problem there is uh, non-resident tuition for international students, that we actively discriminate, uh, discriminate against international students being admitted into our PhD programs. And that is a severe problem for the University of California, and I hope that it's addressed. And I want to convey that message to the senior administration of the system. Um, but the other half, let's face it, was our gender diversity, uh, uh, that we had anomalously low numbers of women. Uh, okay, so that was the context. 
And uh, let me just show you some of the, uh, the data. So this is a pic for those of you who aren't in physics departments, you can see the last column is what's of interest. The, we have 13% women uh, faculty, 33% of our staff are women, postdocs and researchers 19%, graduate students 17%, undergraduate student majors 16%. So that's what uh, is pretty characteristic of many physics departments. I should note, to echo what Meg was saying, and among our postdocs and researchers, virtually all of those are in astrophysics. So astrophysics is a little bit ahead of the game, and that shows that because that's the whole department, physics is even worse. Um, uh, this is just a, a quick look at some of the data. So this is the, the upper left uh, graph shows you the number of PhDs as a function of time. Uh, women are blue, men are pink. Uh, uh, men are, <laughs> uh, women are, uh, men are pink and uh, women are blue. Um, uh, and yeah, it fluctuates, but you can see that we, on the right, that in terms of percentages, we were about at the national average, which is in, in the blue data, but it was, you know, it's fluctuating, but it wasn't, it was looking uh, dangerous. And the, the, the lower graph shows you the number of, uh, of the percentage women admitted to our program, and there's that 2010, one, that's 4%, that's one out of 25 that was admitted. By the way, I think I can say this without offending one as a, as a gay man myself, uh, that, that that one woman, by the way, turned out to be transgendered and made the transition to be, from female to male. So if you like, we even lost that one woman, although it was great that we had an out transgendered person admitted to our program. That was, that at least was, you know, something positive, but it, you know, a double-edged thing. Um, uh, uh, but this was the most alarming trend. The, these are our undergraduate numbers, uh, just bachelor's degrees awarded. The green curve shows you over the national average for physics departments, and the red shows our numbers. And we, were, as I said, were half the national average, and it looked like it was declining. So clearly we had uh, uh, trouble. So, um, so uh, I created a new diversity committee. I decided I was going to make this a priority as chair. Um, <coughs> And I put as chair of that committee, I'm afraid that I picked on one of our older senior women faculty uh, who was very fired up about this. And frankly, she, she really was fired up about it. And I charged her, well, I want you to investigate what's going on and, and provide me with some recommendations. And she, she and her committee came up with huge numbers of recommendations. And, and, and she, she gets a lot of the credit for, for everything that, that, that our department has done since then. And someone was mentioning uh, earlier on about academic personnel not recognizing diversity contributions and promotions and tenure. Well, I'm pleased to say that in her case, I believe that it was recognized, her efforts in this area. She, we, the department recommended an acceleration and the administration came back with more than the department asked for, which is a very rare thing uh, in, our, in our department. So, and it was largely because of the, I think it was largely because of her efforts on diversity and, and she's, she was really terrific, and um, and again deserves most of the credit here. So we drafted a new, we drafted a new anti-hazing and harassment policy to address this issue of bullying in the classroom and in our study room. And uh, every single graduate student and undergraduate in the program was made aware of this. Uh, and uh, every time a new class came in, I talked about that as chair, emphasizing that this was unacceptable behavior. Um, we had a three hour long special session in our TA training class that fall that focused on gender diversity issues and on implicit bias, which every single TA, even TAs who'd already gone through our TA training program, uh, they were forced to or required to attend that if they were going to be a teaching assistant in our department. Um, uh, our women in physics group, for reasons that you'll see later, was fired up by these efforts and they themselves decided to engage in their own recruiting activities. So they invited all our admitted women graduate students for an extra day. Uh, uh, okay. And, uh, and, they, uh, and they actually in, uh, helped increase our recruitment efforts in the, in the subsequent years, uh, 23%. Um, we had a special colloquium on diversity in physics. We created peer mentoring programs for our undergraduates. We tried to actively recruit women undergraduate students into our program. Uh, we worked on curriculum developments to, to, to uh, uh, enable more fl flexible entry paths. And, uh, and we revised the physics web pages uh, thanks to uh, our support from our dean, who's actually here in, our, in the audience. Uh, this, I just want to emphasize, physics departments love to brag about their Nobel Prizes. That's our upper right website. <laughs> the Mount Rushmore website. <laughs> this doesn't exactly create a welcoming environment for, diverse, for people from diverse backgrounds and diverse genders and ethnicities. 
This is our modern website. Uh, it actually has pe you know, people, uh, people, <laughs> younger people of a variety of backgrounds, and, the, and it, it cycles through various uh, images of research and, and again, people. Um, we have a, a, you know, a subset in our diversity website has this beautiful quote, which I think says everything to me about diversity. Insight, I believe, refers to the depth of understanding that comes by setting experiences, yours and mine, familiar and exotic, new and old, side by side, learning by letting them speak to one another. And that's what we're putting that out there is what, is, is what we feel diversity is all about. Um, uh, our women in physics group. And uh, OK, so we invited the site visit com uh, committee after, the, after about a year of work. Um, and as Meg said, they surveyed all students and staff prior to the visit, uh, and, and I had a department report sent to them which detailed all of this data that I sh uh, talked to you about. They met with students, postdocs, researchers, staff, faculty, and campus administrators, all the way up to um, the executive vice chancellor. They met with our dean. Um, and I, by the way, our dean is present here. I want to thank him, Pierre, for all your support in helping us address this issue. And I also want to thank our associate vice chancellor at UCSB for diversity, Maria uh, Herrera Sobek, who also helped provide moral support and financial support for all of this, because you have to pay for these site visits, and, and, they, uh, and the departments don't have a lot of cash. Um, so yeah, they generated the, a, a report. Um, some, most of which was very, very useful. One thing in particular is that they, they, you know, they, they recognized that we weren't mentoring our graduate students appropriately, or, or that is, there wasn't enough broad mentoring. Uh, you know, it was really the, the old um, master-apprentice relationship, and if that relationship is going awry for whatever reasons, because there are personality clashes, both the faculty member and the student are, are not doing well. I'm not speaking into the microphone, am I? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so we have now instituted committees that take on students from the very first year that they arrive, and these committees mentor these students through their entire time, all the way to the PhD, through advancement to candidacy and to, through the PhD. And that provides the faculty member, the advisor, some extra cover, if you like, because they can get advice from fellow faculty members, and it provides the student with extra input as to what's going on. And uh, students who are admitted to say, oh, I don't know, condensed matter theory or string theory, which are very competitive, well, they were admitted into that. And so now members of the faculty from those groups have got to find that student an advisor from the very, they have to take responsibility for those students who are admitted to the program. So it has multiple, multiple uh, benefits. And this came directly out of the site visit. And many other things came out too, but maybe we can get to that in the Q&A. And I've gone on for too long, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm here representing the other coach without the E at the end. Um, this is the Committee on the Advancement of Women Chemists, and I thought it might be useful for you to just know a little bit about the work of this group and what's possible when groups of women come together. Um, so, uh, um, so this is based out of the University of Oregon. I'd like to give my colleague, Jerry Richmond, the lion's share of the credit for this. But just so that you understand the scope of this, um, this has been well-funded through the years. I'm going to show you in a minute that we started in 1997 um, when the granting agencies were very concerned about what was going on for women in the sciences. And then more recently, um, COACH has gone international, which is a whole fascinating area, um, and again, with quite a bit of, of grant support to do this. So we started in 1997 as a group of senior women chemists. There weren't very many of us. We got together as about a dozen of us. So you can tell, well, maybe you can't, but I've been senior for a long time. <laughs> um, and through the years, we have always included women of color, and that's been very illuminating to us to understand what the issues are. It's absolutely heartbreaking to learn um, the lack of graduate students that some of these women have encountered simply because graduate students choose not to work with, with these individuals. Um, but we've included most of the sciences at this point and engineering and we've gone international and we've learning a lot from our colleagues, especially in Africa actually and in Brazil. Um, so what COACH does is we started not being very healthy as this group of senior women. Um, and what I mean by that is we felt that if we weren't really satisfied with our careers or feeling good about what we were doing, how could we help others? And so one of the first things that we did was to develop workshops 
um, with um, facilitators who came in to help us understand how to be better leaders, how to negotiate our own careers better. And over time, we have um, rolled those workshops out to most of this litany of, of letters there, it, the American Chemical Society, American Physical Society, et cetera. And we've reached more than 10,000 women all the way down to the postdoc and even the graduate student level. And the, you know the negotiations workshops are working well. I've never lost a negotiation since I've been on this committee. Uh, but you know they're working well because the, um, we started to get complaints from chairs that um, <laughs> the women were negotiating too well. Um, we took on the American Chemical Society that seemed to think that the only awards that women could get were for women and for service. Um, and all the awards were going to men. And we really worked with them to come up with a better process. And the awards look much better at this point. Um, but I think what I'm really here to tell you a little bit about today, which I have to admit I didn't participate in directly, is that COACH has also gone out to um, a, over 70 departments, has run lots of workshops within departments, as you're hearing about, um, on leadership and, and management. All right. Um, so these workshops, there's your um, picture that is very similar to the one we just saw. Um, the, the purpose of these workshops is to go out and educate the leaders, develop and implement strategies, work to eliminate biases, uh, everything that we've been hearing. And we've been doing some surveys pre and post. Um, we've tried to follow up and embarrass chairs that don't come back to us with things that they were trying to implement and what the outcome of that has been. Um, and so I, I won't say that this is the only solution, but I want to argue that solutions like this, of people getting together and talking about how hard this is and what some of the solutions might be, um, is really very positive. Um, this is just part of the survey that we've done pre and post. And I just picked out a few things. What I thought was interesting was even during a workshop, as limited as that time period is, um, it was interesting how the chairs um, very significantly changed their views depending on what happened in that workshop. So URM faculty have fewer opportunities to be mentored by top chemists, uh, almost doubled. Um, URM faculty have difficulty competing for the best graduate students. So chairs didn't even know that this was, was happening. Women do less self-promoting and marketing themselves, subtle biases against women accumulate. So we have a lot of data of this type that um, you can influence at least through the period of the workshop how people are thinking about this. Um, and what I want to end with is that many chairs need education and training. They need support. And um, it's difficult to manage some of these, as you, as you just heard, um, some of the issues that are going on. And I guess what I'd like to promote at this point is, first of all, a really terrific shout out to Susan Carlson for bringing us all together over five roundtables. And with the hope, uh, it's on video, that this will continue somehow because we, we still have so much to do and so much to understand um, in terms of, of trying to figure out what to do next. And these groups that get together are really important. And this is one that's been around for a long time and has been, I think, incredibly successful. I mean, I feel like I owe a lot of my success and career to this group. And by the way, every single woman that participated back in 1997 is in some leadership role, including the African-American women. A couple of them have just taken on some really fabulous roles. So this, these things are really important, and I hope that we'll have an opportunity um, to continue in, in some way. Thank you. OK, thank you, everyone. Uh, and just you know, give them a chance to get back up. Thanks, all of the panelists. I really appreciate the different points of view on, this, um, on the site visits. We have about 20 minutes for questions, and I'm going to remind everybody to use the microphone and to introduce yourself when you ask the question. And there's a couple of microphones floating around. I saw your hand first, so sorry. I have uh, the questions is for, yeah, uh, Alakubaj, uh, UT. Uh, I have three questions, actually, just a qu quick questions for Meg. First, what's the cost for that? I mean, would it, I mean, for uh, the, this is number one, let me yeah. do the other two. 
to are you aware of any other like for the American chemical do you are you aware of other you know fields that do the same things and the last one you mentioned this needs to be at the request of the chair and it goes to the chair how about when the chair is is part of the problem so i mean so how do ah. you deal with okay yeah 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 sorry i meant to say all those things they're on my laptop that disappeared on the plane on saturday um uh, oh. the the cost is just like any other visiting committee. At the beginning, the American Physical Society paid for the chair, and the other members are paid by the university. But now I think that may still be true, but it's, it's, it's in the noise. The real cost is borne by the university. And sorry, three was too many. What, what, the, what if the chair is the problem? Thank you. What if the chair is the problem? I dare say they wouldn't have invited. But actually, no, that's not true. I, I've been on several, one, you know, mostly with chairs who are extraordinarily uh, proactive and engaged but one the chair was not super good I'm not sure why he invited us but he was a nice person who wanted to do better I mean and and it's like a, doing a performance evaluation you know as scientists we sort of think of those as horrible because they're involved in criticism but you have to think of it as a way that everybody wants it to be better you know it's better for the chair no matter how backward their current behavior might be, it's better for the chair to have a performing department with high percentages of women. And so it's really, this This came from a coach uh, thing I went to, actually, at the APS I now remember, is you have to emphasize the win-win. So you emphasize what they can do to make their situation better. And I forgot to say, we often meet with uh, administration officials, deans, provosts, et cetera, who also want to hear about this, right? So so the, the chair is aware that you know, somebody up the chain is, is paying attention. So Victoria Sork, UCLA, and I'm Dean of Life Sciences, so that's the perspective that I, I make my comments. But first I wanna say, I really appreciated all the sort of ideas and best practices that are hearing at the table, and I hope at some point they get compiled because I go places over and over again and it seems like we're we're trying to use oral history to spread the word on best practices. And it would certainly be nice if, uh, increasingly, University of Michigan does a great job. There's web websites all over. But the University of California could perhaps put them together. Um, something um, that comes up as I, as I think about this, and you know, I, I'm constantly looking for better ways to diversify our faculty, better ways to create a climate so that our faculty are successful. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate is the fact that you're saying, okay, if we see problems with women, we have the, we have the critical mass there. If we're seeing problems that they're, they're not enough, they're not being treated well, they're not doing as well, that's the canary. But I, I wanna point out something that I've also seen and then end with a question about whether you've observed it or thought about it. One of the things that I've seen is that the same kinds of climate that allow uh, implicit bias towards women faculty, um, discrimination, towards um, underrepresented minorities is a climate of hostility towards students. So one of the things is when I started working on diversifying our faculty, I have a diversity advisory group that's constantly pushing me, and that's good. That's good, but they keep going, well, what about this, what about that? And one of the things that I'm concerned is promoting, trying to get the pipeline, right? And what I'm seeing is many of our scientists are actually anti-student. They actually are not wanting to get students into math, not wanting to get students in. And I think that this is so, I'm sorry, I think we've got a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. We can make climate better for women, <laughs> but if we're treating students, I think it's the same climate that leads to faculty feeling it's their job to weed out people they think aren't bright enough. So we have a real big climate issue on campus and I think it's hurting our pipeline um, and I saw it a little bit on the physics faculty when you were so candid to talk about the problems, but that sort of bias comes out against our students. And I'm particularly concerned because we're losing students in the first year with, um, with the uh, science courses where they're being treated with such hostility. The, they, they leave the sciences before they even start taking life science courses. And of course, we have our own problems. I'm not saying we don't, then it continues. So, have you thought about it? And have you thought about, because at the departmental level, you're, you're in the trenches. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, well, well, let me just say, uh, I think, uh, well, certainly I, I can speak, uh, uh, I'm gonna be too honest again. Um, 
so, so our physics department, of course, teaches uh, the life science, uh, the physics for life sciences uh, course on our on our campus. So thousands of life science majors, pre meds, all want to be doctors, uh, and uh, and frankly, some of them. I, I, it's not that I want to weed them out, but some of them are not cut out uh, for, for that. Um, I don't think we have active hostility to them, but I don't think we teach them very well, frankly. I think we could do much better. I, I, w where your point actually resonated with me is, is frankly, with the way uh, many uh, of our faculty treat staff. Where I do think, it's not, it's not hostile, but it's certainly belittling. Um, and I think it's unacceptable uh, that you know we're we're highly trained, highly educated people, and our, and these staff are there to serve us. And I think I, I know that some of my colleagues treat staff very poorly. And this actually came out in the site visit report uh, as well. And uh, that I think is a reflection of our general attitudes towards I don't know pe maybe people who are different than us. Uh, I, I don't know. But th that's where it resonated with me. Do you want to add anything? Or? I, I thought oh. Angie might want to say something about better teaching pedagogy, yeah. and then I'll ask, yeah. ask my question. Yeah, uh, definitely. So I guess I would beg to differ that students aren't cut out. Um, what I see are students who are incredibly capable with very varied backgrounds, especially at the University mm -hmm. of California mm -hmm. with all the, the low-income, first-generation students coming from backgrounds that aren't academic. And we are not giving them a chance, nor are the other students in the class. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is also, there's a lot of hostility coming from those students who are choosing to work with people that they think will get them ahead uh -huh. and are not helping these other students. Mm -hmm. And so I think we really need to, I couldn't agree more, really change the pedagogy, stop teaching this stuff that requires mere memorization of, um, I mean, we have super memorizers at Berkeley, I can guarantee that, okay? Can they think? I'm not so sure. Can they do problems they've never seen before? I can tell you they can't, all right? so I. I, I think we need to change the pedagogy and we need to stop talking poorly about students and understand their backgrounds. This is such an important point. I, I, I want to jump in too, although I don't think we should yeah. keep all our time talking, but just really, really important. Um, Yale happens to be a place where teaching science is very highly valued. My department really cares about it and we do pretty well and even there it's bad. So this is why I'm saying it. There's still that look to the left, look to the right, one or two of you won't be here. That's ridiculous in the 21st century. Um, you know, Seymour and Hewitt told us, taught us all years ago that we are not, the physics professors in, in my department, the chemistry professors across the way, they still think that the very best students are the ones who are sticking with the major. And this is completely wrong, as Seymour and Hewitt showed and others have shown. So we, we really need to work on this. Let me just, the reason I wanted to jump in is not to say things you already know, but to point out, almost every science class I know is graded on a curve. This is immediately a statement that you will do better if your neighbor does worse. We know that cooperative learning is the best way to learn and that working together, teaching each other is the best way to learn. So why are we grading on a curve? I cannot persuade my colleagues about this. They are totally resistant. You know, they did it that way when they were kids and they don't know how to design a test that doesn't have an average of 50, so they have to curve. But nonetheless, we should be promoting cooperative learning and better pedagogical approaches for sure. So I just can want I to say, Meg, I do not grade on the curve. Even in the oh, large classes, you. I do not. All right, I don't <laughs> grade on the curve either. either. I, I, I just want to. You know, yeah, these are the, these are the exceptional yeah. people. So the, there's, I just want to add a very brief comment uh, based on uh, observing our physics department here, which is not my department, but I'm going to brag about them a little bit. The, um, there are ways to teach those sorts of introductory courses that um, that reach a more diverse audience. And so the, the physics for, for pre-meds uh, here is taught in a way that sort of flips the class, where there's very little lecture and a lot more experience. And I think, that, I know there's a physicist who will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my understanding is that then when they test the stu its students, essentially women do as well as, they, as the men do, which they don't necessarily do in the more traditional curriculum. And they have as much knowledge of physics at the end as the students in the more traditionally taught class, and I believe they retain it longer, too. I'm not sure about that last point, so hopefully Actually, one of our... I, I introduced that at Yale okay. a decade ago, and, and, and they do better than the traditional classes, yeah. but the women are the tops in both classes, actually. So I, I have a question for Meg. 
Is there a lower limit to the size of department where it makes sense to have a site visit? And oh, if so, what, why, or um, if not, why? Yeah, so the site visits that I'm familiar with, the departments are all sort of moderate sized, so sort of above 20 faculty. Um, certainly the survey data, if, if there are too few students, they don't get disaggregated because then you can tell who they are. So, so it work, tends to work better. But the very largest department we visited, which was about 70 faculty, um, I would say there our impact was less. Actually, it's really interesting. 70 faculty, 200 physics majors, and we saw maybe under 10 students in our various gatherings. Um, just one quick comment on this. I meant to say it after I talked about it. I hope that Susan finds a way that we can continue this. Wouldn't it be nice if um, both interactive theater and workshops for departments were broadly available to the system through UCOP, right? That there was a protocol mm. that was written out and these were tested and we really knew how to do them well, mm. right? What a great idea, yeah. Right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, and then really advertised out to the, to the universities, right? So that we wouldn't have to find out where you could go, right? Right now the chairs don't necessarily know where to go. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Romick from, uh, from Davis. Uh, so I have a quick question for Meg and a question for Omer. Um, so these site, I'm from a math department, so these site visits, are they only for physics? I mean, oh, is there anything the equivalent for other areas? So I know that the American Astronomical Society, of which I'm about to become president, so I de definitely have to know this, uh, they're about, they, we have started one. We haven't yet done any visits. I don't think the math, American Mathematical Society has done one, is doing this. But you okay. may know more. Mm -hmm. So, and the question for Omer is, uh, you mentioned this issue with uh, non-resident student tuition, and I couldn't get a sense of whether you pointed this out as a problem in general or specifically in the context of diversity in your department it, because you didn't really elaborate about it's that. It's a so. problem of the, uh, I, I guess, the image that the, that the University of California is projecting uh, to, the, to, the, to the nation uh, because many physics departments in the UC are, are ranked low. And it's not because, uh, I mean, it is partly because of gender diversity, but the, you know, many physics departments have this problem across the nation. What singles us out and pushes us down in the rankings is our lack of international students. And so if you happen to be a woman or a minority and you look at the diversity rankings and you find that these UC physics departments are ranked very low, that's not going to help those, those physics departments increase their gender or, or ethnic diversity because of this extra factor that's, that's uh, So it's kind of a vicious cycle in some sense. Yes, that, that's I my see. very strong opinion, yes. Okay. Not that we don't have problems with gender and ethnic diversity. But, but, yeah. Hello, Elena Fuentes, Affleck UCSF. Two questions for Omer. I was struck by two things that you said. One was around the awareness that when you became chair, you became aware of these issues. So I'm wondering how can we increase awareness among faculty of what is happening in terms of uh, the gender diversity, which was what you brought to us. The second is around the bullying that you described happening within the classrooms. Um, that's very concerning to me. I think that can happen in so many settings. So what have you done to address that and what do you consider effective strategies? So the, the, there, uh, uh, the first question, I've already forgotten the first question. <laughs> the, the awareness? Oh, the awareness, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, it's rather shocking that I wasn't aware of these issues before I became chair, right? And, and uh, I'm afraid it was women faculty who, who brought these things to my attention, maybe in the hopes that I would actually do something finally as, as, a, as a new chair. Uh, and I think most of the male faculty in our department were completely unaware of this. They are not unaware now because of everything that we did and then having the site visit, which you know, interviewed all the students, that, uh, the, everyone read the report. We had faculty meetings after the site visit discussing the report. And I think people are very uh, aware of the issue. That doesn't mean that, they're all, that all of them are on board with some of the changes that we're proposing. But, uh, I think having a site visit uh, is a good way of raising awareness. I, otherwise, you, well, you also have to discuss this issue openly in faculty meetings. I think it requires the leadership of the chair. I mean, it, it does. Regarding bullying, so 
uh, again, we created this anti-hazing document, which is on our website and is distributed to all students, both uh, undergraduates and graduate students, when they enter the program. And when I met with them as chair, welcoming them to the department, I emphasized this very, very strongly. The document is, uh, is displayed prominently in our, in our physics study room. And nevertheless, bullying continues to occur. So after I stopped being chair, there was another incident, actually a bullying by under, male undergraduates to a female TA in our physics study room. And this time, the, the chair immediately leapt onto it. So it, it was reported to the chair. The chair uh, broadcast this, to, look, this is a, this, everyone in the, the department has to take responsibility for this. All of us as faculty talked about this in our classes, stating that this in incident occurred. I talked about it in my class, stating the, the fact that physics historically has had a, a low representation of women, and we are dealing with this, historic, th this, this context, and, uh, and we are trying to work our way through it and, and trying to improve on it, and this is unacceptable behavior. And, we, and you simply have to continue to address it, and address it, and address it. In a male-dominated environment, there are inevitably uh, inappropriate behaviors that get generated by immature people and, and people who, should, who are not so immature and should know better. And, uh, and you have to continually fight it. There's no magic bullet that I know of. If anyone does know of a magic bullet, I would love to know. Oh. <laughs> uh, Adam Bergasser, uh, UC San Diego, YAA, yet another astrophysicist. Um, Omar, I wanted to just comments that I think your example illustrates very clearly the uh, benefit of having a chair who comes in and takes charge and, and leads from, from above. And I, I wanted to, to really thank you for your leadership uh, with your department. I had yeah. lots of help, both from sure, the faculty sure, sure, and sure. from the administrators that I was working with, believe me. I, uh, Meg, I wanted to ask you about these re the repeat site visits. Uh, we had a site visit back in 1998. Uh, it, we finally dug up that report again. We've been looking at it. Um, and we've been thinking about having a repeat visit, but I wanted to understand the, the context of these repeat site visits. Um, do you look at the recommendations from the previous visit and the implementation? Uh, and, and what sort of motivates uh, CWP to actually go out and do a second site visit? Um, yeah, good question. So there haven't been that many requests. I think that, that they've all been, uh, basically every request that's come in more or less gets done. So it's not like there's a prioritization yet. Um, and then the, the time interval between two site visits is really long in, mo in the, case, the few cases where it's happened. And so I think, although of course that the, the committee can look at the previous report, in many ways it's just a different time. I mean, the University of Maryland I think was the first site visit and, in 1990, and then they were visited again in the early two, you know, mid 2000s. So it's just long enough apart that it's hard to focus on. And also, because there isn't a great deal of follow-up, there's a pretty limited follow-up, it's also hard to sort of, it's not the kind of uh, visiting committee, I guess what I was, the point I was trying to make without saying it, but let me just say it, is, you know, a provost office keeps track of a visiting committee every seven years that goes to a department and, and, and charts how it should be changing. I think this is so intermittent that no such thing has been done, and I'm not sure it could be done. I think it's really an excuse um, for an independent body to ask questions of students and faculty and get real answers that a chair is not going to get. So I, I just want to add maybe Gibor Basri would like to say a little bit more about what our review committees are doing that come in to de review departments. Because we built this into that process. One way to partially address that is to build it into the academic program review process, which was mentioned earlier. So we, we have very explicit guidelines in the academic program review documents that both the external committee and the internal committees need to look at this long set of questions. We're going to give you this big set of data, and we would like answers to these questions that are, that are directly related to those. And, and departments totally pay attention to what happens during academic program review, so that's, that's not an issue either, you know, and, and they're not asking for it or not asking for it, they're, get it, they're getting it. So I think that's uh, one way to deal with, with some of this. It's not quite the same thing as a, as a, a site visit like that, but, but actually some of, you know, and the external committees are of varied quality when they do this, but sometimes they really take that seriously and then that really does help. And then SWEM, you might say, Gibor. 
Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, no, just the, our, our Senate committee. The, the, other, the other part of this is in the internal process, the Academic Senate has used to have three committees that participated in the review. Now it has four, the, the Senate Committee on Status of Women and Ethnic Minorities is a member of the review board. So they, they have a representative present at all the site visit meetings and so on, so that this doesn't get forgotten either. Mm. They're also doing follow-up work, like two, three years later, they're going back to the unit and having a conversation. So l l let me add yeah. one thing that to this though. Uh, Meg was saying that there's very little follow-up uh, on the AP, APS site visits, and actually that's, in my view, a good thing as chair, because I would have been more reluctant to have invited them if I knew that I was then, mm -hmm creating a huge amount of workload for myself from then on. I'm going to have the site visit, then I'm going to have to write a report, and then I'm going to have to write another follow-up report. And, and so it, it's, it's very light. And, and that, that means it's, it's, I have no excuse, really, to, uh, but to invite them, right? Because they can actually help me, and I'm not going to have to do a lot of work, uh, bureaucratic yeah, work following I, it. I think what I, I've yeah. made a couple comments that sound yeah. critical, and I don't I, I want to leave that impression. I, in fact, I think it's an opportunity, right? It's yeah. an opportunity. A chair is asking for a... Uh, 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 some assistance in creating a moment, a teachable moment in the department. Right. And what the follow-up is less critical in that sense. I think if you can institutionalize it as you've done at UC, that's obviously more effective. But for most universities and most departments, they're just not as um, integrated and holistic as, as, as the University of California. Yeah. I, I do not, okay. Sorry, I do not some of the advanced schools in their institutionalization are doing just that, making sure that in regular program reviews, diversity is it, is a major uh, part of it. I just had a couple of quick comments about the international issue that Omer raised and connected to a, an earlier comment maybe from Yolanda. Um, there was a, a big system-wide meeting last week about graduate education, and I wasn't there, and some of you may have been, but I know one of the issues on the table was what to do about the extra charge to international and out-of-state students and what that might mean for the quality of our student body. So people are talking about that and um, it's, it's on the radar. Uh, and then the second related issue, um, and I think it's partly you know, what we still need to talk about that we haven't focused on is the whole international issue in terms of our demographics. You know, our, our latter rank faculty, for example, um, are, over um, almost 23% are non-US citizens. So that's our assistant professors and tenured professors. So it's a quarter of our faculty. Um, and it's important to recognize that, I think, as a part of who we are and, and how we function. And then I think also to think back in terms of graduate students and postdocs and what that means and how that becomes part of talking about climate. So I'd like to uh, start by thanking Omar for sharing dirty laundry. I, I, I'm Ed Callahan, University of California, Davis. I appreciate the sharing of dirty laundry because I think that that's critical to solving problems. Right. And only when we have the data about what things are going wrong can we start to work on solutions. So I've got a little extra to add and then I want to ask the question. I'm, I'm, in medicine, we've started to ask questions about how different groups are treated. We had no data on what the medical school experience was for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people because it was too sensitive a question to ask, so it wasn't being asked. We finally asked it last year of second, all the second year students, and we found that the LGBT kids had a different experience, which was much more like those who came from families where no one had gone to college. They were less connected, they had a harder time, it was more stressful. The nice thing about that is by getting that data now in, schools of medicine are gonna be, is gonna be visible. Who's taking good care of their LGBT uh, students? Who's setting up a healthy environment for them. So that's a positive thing that comes out of taking the chance of looking at your laundry to see what is dirty. We have the UC climate report that keeps coming out saying 80% of our faculty are very happy and we just sort of throw away everybody else that hasn't had as good an experience. It's having 
a different experience. And I think that that's not at all conducive to identifying problems and to doing serious constructive work. I wonder if you have any comments on that and ab about the way we as the University of California can start to take our dirty laundry seriously and address our own problems. Uh. Heavily involved with the, Saved the by yes, thank you, Gabor. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that, that astrophysicists looking out for seventy-five each other. <laughs> or eighty percent figure positive. You know, uh, get, a gets criticized a lot, but b uh, that's the one the one first bullet. The entire rest of uh, our our presentation is usually forty minutes. The entire rest of it is about you know so but there weren't there were people who weren't so happy here here's how we disaggregate that you know in all these various categories and that's the only place where you're going to you know sort of be able to do anything and the point of the climate climate survey was to you know conceive new actions the fact that 80% of the and it turns out that 80% you know of course matches with the the white and asian demographic typically <laughs> as we look at these various categories um, so so you can't generate much of an action from that one. So I think when people are presenting the climate survey, you know, fine, that, that was one result. And then there are about 50 other results which are more actionable that are not that one. Any other comments on that or any of the other things you've heard? No, okay. Uh, well, we're out of time, so I want to thank the panelists for a very engaging discussion and thank the uh, participants for very engaging questions.